Oshin, you're, you're just back from a trip to, to Palestine and you're involved with Troker. Can you tell us why you went out there and what you've seen? Um, why I went out there, I suppose I've had a, an interest in what's been going on out there for some time. I uh, was asked to go last year, couldn't go last year. My wife's just after having a child, so um, got the opportunity to go this year and it was a massive eye opener, mm. you know. Um, I could see correlations with you know my youth and and sort of what's going on over there. Uh, you know the the oppression, the um, the intimidation, that sort of thing. Uh, but this is on a different scale, I suppose. In what in what sense? I suppose people in general that aren't even from Ulster probably wouldn't even well, necessarily be able to kind of connect with that sentiment. Well, I suppose you know when we grew up, we grew up. Uh, you know, um, there was an army barracks. And cross it was it back right on to the uh, football pitch uh, it was very common for soldiers to meet you in the street you know to not let you pass uh, to intimidate you you know I, I was talking about the time that I think we were we were going to Armagh training I think we were stopped six or seven times on the way to training when they got our stuff they emptied it on the road they rummaged through it and they left it there and we had it was our job to put it back into the bag uh, that's just some of it, I mean, we trained in Lorgan at that stage, and uh, I think I remember leaving cross around six, half six, and arriving down at a quarter to ten, getting a cup of tea and heading home again. So, you know, that's the sort of, uh, it was just, as I say, it was, it was intimidation, it was oppression, it was meant to keep you down. And uh, so that's the sort of stuff that, that I would have uh, grown up with, and uh, the stuff that I suppose. <clears throat> at that time seemed very much like the norm to me because I didn't know any different. I grew up there and and that was the case. I was only at 11 when I went to New school in Newry. <clears throat> it was about 16 miles away or 35 minutes on a bus. And uh, when I got there, I realised not everybody's living in the same conditions with what we were living in. And I see I seen correlation between what we had uh, in Cross and what they have out there. Um, one of the things... The kids are very happy, seem very happy. And I remember my youth as being very happy, regardless of what was going on, because as I say, you see it as the norm and you just get on with it. You know, you expect that this is happening everywhere. You know, kids are there, they don't have a lot. They don't have a lot of areas to play in. Um, you know, they don't have the gadgets that our own kids have. But they're happy playing marbles in the road with the car, with cars was in the past. And that's, you know, that's, it's refreshing mm. in one way, um, but it's very difficult to look at in another. So what, what challenges are they facing there? Like, What's the quality of life like out there and what is it you're looking to achieve with Troker? Well, I suppose w one of the industries that, that uh, we looked at when we were out there was the fishing industry. Uh, it's basically been obliterated um, because of the blockade, because of the fact that they're supposed to have 20 miles in, in all of the, in, in which they can fish in, and that has been reduced to six miles. The stocks, there is no stock anymore. Uh, you know, the, the guys who were earning a decent living um, are no longer earning that. So there's a knock-on effect because the guy he has it with him on the bus is not earning any money. That has a knock-on effect to his family. Um, so, like, we met, you know, a couple of those fishermen, and they sort of give us a synopsis of, uh, of that. But to be honest, I was looking at the, the economical constraints, but they weren't really looking at that. One of the things that they said was that, you know, you know, at least we can go out and at least we can fish. But like literally the jurisdiction in which the, audio, uh, the distance in which they can travel out to fish has been reduced and reduced and reduced. Some days they go out into the sea and they don't know for that particular day how far they can go. And if they go further than they're allowed to, they get fired upon. Mm -hmm. So it's much, much more than economical now as well. It's, it's as I say, it's, it's the intimidation, but it's also the risk of their life every time they go out on that boat, you know? Do you feel that you get, I mean, like for balance sake, we'll say, you know, obviously the Palestinians have it unbelievably harshly. Do you get the Israeli side of it? Do they try to appeal to you and say, well, look, this is why we're behaving this sort of way? Do, do, do they try to kind of put that to you? Uh, no. But um, I'd be happy for them to. Mm. Uh, I suppose the, the one thing that, that when I went out is one point that I made was that I'm not particularly political. Mm. Um, and that I was going out from a humanitarian point of view. 
but it's very difficult to avoid the politics of it when you get out there. It's very difficult for you to see uh, the Israeli say whenever you see the impoverished uh, conditions that um, Palestinians are living in. You see the oppression, you see the walls. I mean, effectively, they're in a open air jail. You know, there's two million people in this area, an area that's smaller than uh, than County Louth. And in historical senses, surely this smacks of, uh, have you not seen what's happened in history before? Surely lessons can be learned by people from your background as much as anyone. Absolutely, and, and that was initially what's, you know, what sparked my interest. Um, that's why I wanted to talk about it, but I want, as I say, I wanted to talk more about you know, the conditions. I wanted to talk about more about uh, the oppression. And, you know, we, we would, uh, there's a lot of people spending a lot of money in, in this country um, trying to get more resilience, whether that be a, a football team or a, a large corporate industry. Um, and there's a lot of people making money out of it. But if you want to see real resilience, you just have to travel there because in my mind all the time I'm thinking what have you you know when I'm when I'm talking to somebody I'm thinking what have you got to look forward to uh, but they don't they're not seeing it like that they're seeing that you know let's make the most of what we have and believe me that is not a lot did you go out there not really knowing what to expect whether it would affect you kind of half wondering am I the right person to even be going out there like and then how much did it affect you um I never really thought about it like that I just I just sort of went because I was a why not sort of thing. Not even not even why not, but I, I was fairly sure that you know I could handle whatever was going to be thrown at me. Um, but I was I was surprised at the level of it. I was surprised at the level of um, the level of poverty. I was surprised at the level the level of intimidation. I was surprised when you just look at the wall that has been constructed. Like the the resources that went into that I'm not, again I'm not talking financial but just the you know the uh, human capital even yeah the human capital and what's that saying to let's say for example what's that saying to Palestinians but also what is it saying to the Israelis what's it saying to young Israelis mm. and um, and and that just that, that was something that, uh, to be honest, when I went to the refugee camp, that was something that, to be honest, was, was fairly difficult to handle. And that was the, one of the things that I took home with me was, um, you know, the, the, you know, the Israelis, I think, two nights previously had gone in and sprayed the walls. Um, and when it rained, you know, the, it, it stunk, basically, the, the camp out. And uh, I remember thinking... You know, I'm finding it very difficult to even walk through this camp. You know, how are people living in it? Uh, as I said, I don't really have any... Young lads don't really have any area for play, although in, in either camp they did have a, a little football pitch and we had a bit of a kick around. So, uh, But again, these kids were so happy, but also you could see they were so aggressive as well. Aggressive, you know, really? Yeah, they were aggressive with each other. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Aggressive with each other. And you could see that uh, deep down... You know they are being affected by it. So one of the projects, obviously, that I was interested in was the mental health project and um, and how it how it affects their mental health because in the face of it, they just seem to be getting on with things. But you know when the do- when the w- when the doors close, it's it's a lot more different than that. So football is obviously fairly trivial in in many senses, but of course it's very important. Like a lot of players, managers put 40, 50 hours a week into it and all their thinking goes into it. You mentioned kind of the resources and the money that goes into resilience and trying to teach people to be resilient in a GEA sense. What, what's your thoughts in general on that? Now, it's just because you brought it up, I thought of asking, all the money being ploughed into resilience, is it going in the right way? Is it merited? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think there's, there's, some, there's some merit in it. Are there some frauds out there too? Uh, I'm pretty sure there, there are. Um, I just think that uh, you get a huge amount of resilience from being beaten. Yeah. And uh, if you're Dublin right now, you're getting beaten. If you're, if you're sorry, if you're not Dublin right now, you're getting beaten. Um, so you should be getting your own resilience from that, and it's, it's how you deal with that mentally. It's what it's what you're telling yourself. And I think it, like it, for me, a good coach can can tell you that. Like I, we've worked on the brilliant uh, sports psychologist sports psychologists in Armagh and we were lucky to have them and uh, they taught us a huge amount 
Um, so there's place for them also. Mm. Uh, but like defeat wouldn't be long building a bit of resilience in you. And you know, I think of the resilience for some of the guys who are playing football in Division Three and Division Four. And uh, I'm thinking, apart from the league, you know, when the league ends, you know, what's what what's in your mind at that stage? Like, what gives you the uh, get up and go to to go again and and to and to see how you can achieve in the championship? So, uh, uh, there's a huge amount to be said for resilience, but like one of the best ways to get it is maybe a few defeats mm. and uh, and see how you can bounce back from that. You're uh, after going over to Monaghan to take over in a scheme, am I right? Um, wh- why did that come about? I mean, you were managing your own Cross McGlen with John McEntee just a couple of years ago. Yeah, I went from uh, I did three years of Cross. I did two years as joint manager with John, and I did a, a year as a coach with Gareth. Uh, probably had enough of it at that stage, to be honest. Um, a lot of guys still there that I would have played with, and. Uh, I suppose I just felt it needed a fresher voice than than me. Um, so is that is that also time. some things are a bit too close to the bone at home? Making decisions can have impacts beyond football. Yeah, well, it's a good way to fall out with most of the town. Um, <laughs> is to is to take over senior management. Um, so after that, I got promotion to the under sixes, uh, <laughs> on to the under eights now. Uh, I was with Centre Town and Meath for the last uh, year and a half, two years. So. Uh, got a good bit of experience there and really enjoyed my time there. Um, I suppose just logistically, it just wasn't going to work anymore. Yeah. It's 50 minutes to an hour from from the house, you know, there and back. So that's two hours before you do any training session. Uh, it wasn't sustainable, uh, along with family life. Um, and any scheme, uh, they ha- they sort of tick all the boxes. They have. Uh, an unbelievable setup uh, as far as their infrastructure is concerned. They have a, their age profile for um, as a playing unit uh, looks good, and they have been sort of been yo yo in between intermediate and senior, but they're an established senior team now, so uh, they feel as if they can make the, br- uh, the step on to the next thing. And then the convenience 15 minutes away from the house. Um, so I, I know a good few of the players because I had a lot of them through the college and the dock. So I suppose that gives me a bit of a jump on, you know, on things as far as you know preparation, know what they're about, uh, a bit of an insight into what the psyche's like. Um, and I just like what I've seen. I like, you know, when I when I chatted them, I like, you know, where they wanted to take this and where they wanted to go. So. I'm just delighted to be in there. I actually can't wait to get started now. You know, it's it's just a, it's another challenge, but also uh, it's another opportunity. I spoke with Oshin O'Neill after I, I'd say the county final had been done, and he spoke about how, you know, John McEntee was involved with Clan Tibbert, and the night that Cross won the county final, that knowing that Clan Tibbert against Cross was coming, he was in the in the the Cross um, clubhouse that night. Was that a very funny sort of a week and situation? <coughs> it was, and. Uh, John might come in and lucky for him, Clontibber, he was in the, his Clontibber gear, but uh, he, yeah. yeah, but Clontibber are more or less the same colours as ourselves. He had a black top on and it was, uh, there was a bit of amber or yellow in it, so uh, he, uh, you know, he was he was he wasn't in the skies. He, he he very much uh, he very much fitted in. Um, it was a strange week, I suppose. It was a strange week for John. I I seen the interview that you did with Oshin and like. The respect that all those lads would have for for John would be um, would be immense. I suppose the one thing when you spoke to Oshin at that stage is no one ever seen it coming that they were actually going to beat us. Yeah. And uh, that was that was a little bit that was difficult. Didn't speak to him for a couple of days after. But uh, everybody just wished him well, and um, they were just slightly better in crossing the night and. Still think of Cross had to get over that game that we we could have made a bit of a dent in also. Uh, so I suppose that was pretty second in defeat from our point of view. Would you would you be watching the club championship even now? The Cross are gone. Watching it closely. Do you have any sort of tip for the All Ireland? I suppose most people would be assuming that Carfin are going to do a, a first three in a row. Well, I think uh, first of all, I've been watching it. Yeah, I don't I don't miss any of it. Um, 
it's it's weird obviously because it's more condensed form than it has been so when an Ulster or when a Leinster or a Connors, it's not right I can sit back for a couple of weeks and sort of you need to be you know it's a continuous thing now so it's still like it feels like a bit of a different competition um, but I think I've written off Kilku in their last five games maybe expected them to be beaten in all five and they're still there um, so they just they've just a real knack of getting getting it done, mm. and I have had you know the whole way through down. The most complete performance was the last day. That was that was a proper performance. But before that, like they've been stuttering and stammering through games, um, and they finally you know they finally kind of ended the Ulster hoodoo after being in, that was their seventh time in there and they finally won it. Yeah, we beat them a couple of times in it, and uh, they had a couple of sickening uh, defeats, uh, plenty of heartache. Resilience is big with them, and uh, they were able to bounce back. Um, they were like a team that were going to were we're going to keep trying until the one one, you know. And and you have to you have to say that is a that's a very admirable quality in, in any team uh, when they consider the amount of knocks they got. But uh, so they just keep getting it done. So don't be surprised if they are in, a, in an All Ireland final. But I, look, at I, I expect Carl Finn to win. It seems to have opened up nicely for them. I don't think they will feel that they played. They've played brilliantly so far. But uh, there's usually a couple of big performances. In. And the thing about Carl Finn is they usually usually save their best performance for All Ireland finals. Yeah, because they've won them all by double digits. I think like the three that they've won in the last four or five years. Um, what about Armagh then? So this year, Ulster semi-final replay lost to Cavan, if I'm correct, and losing to Mayo in the qualifiers. Whereabouts are they in terms of their development? Should they be kicking on? Should they be further ahead at this stage? Uh, I think we're probably at where we should be at. Yeah. <coughs> I think uh, I would look to Armagh to have significant improvement this year, as in you know pushing for promotion or getting promotion to Division 1 and, and making the Super 8. I think that's realistically where I need to be now. Um, we have, there's good talent there, there's good young lads. Everybody who you would want playing with Armagh is playing with Armagh. And that hasn't happened. Last year was probably the first year that that happened. Uh, but they're going to add a few more young lads as well now. Um, so, I would think that I'm I realistic as I say should be pushing for promotion and looking to get into the last eight and if they can do that that'll be a very successful season and will sort of be I think that'll be us sort of back where we sort of feel as if we need to be Do you think you have many at the elite level players that you need to challenge those you know very top sides like Gerald Burns looks like he could be a top player Jamie Clark presumably be back on his day he's one of the top level players do you have enough of those? Well i just I just give you a um, James Morgan, who who uh, missed out in a bit of the season last year, Ryan O'Neill, Oshin O'Neill, Jared Oak Burns, um, Jamie Clark, Stephen Campbell, Neil Grimley. Um, there's players there who I think we're getting a lot of teams, you know, in Ireland. Um, so top quality players are there. I just think we need a wee bit more now from. Uh, there's a couple of young lads from Clanairn, uh, Torbert, McCambridge. Uh, there's another guy owns. I'm not sure if he's going to be involved this year. Um, but if we could get all those involved, it might just bring us on. You know, just that little bit more where we need to be. Uh, we need a little bit more pace. Yeah. Uh, I thought it felt as if we at times we lacked that little bit of pace just to get us through that Mayo game or even through that Cavan game. So. Uh, a wee bit more of a scoring threat as well. I think Jamie probably needs to go back to being uh, <clears throat> somebody who's, who's your scope, one of your scope, main score getters. Very accurate. Just need to get him into space a little bit more. Not easiest thing done, especially in Ulster. But uh, that's I think that's what he that's what he needs to be. And uh, th- and I think if we can get those a uh, couple of things, which as I say are not easy got, but if we can get certainly improvement in those areas, then it'll be hard to talk to. Because you mentioned Stephen Campbell there, and I remember four or five years ago. I remember that time narrowly lost to Donegal and Croke Park. That looked like a year, like Donny or sorry Armagh are ready to kick on now. He probably 
I, I was kind of thinking, geez, this guy could become one of the best players in Ireland. And last year, we saw flashes of it again. Now, obviously, I wouldn't know the ins and outs of what's going on with him, but he had a tweet about, you know, a year without gambling, this kind of thing. And, you know, that's something that you would have yeah. gone through as well. I, is he at a stage now in his life where you think he can kick on to become that player that he looked like he could become? Um, spoke to him not that long ago. Seems to be in a great place mentally. Uh, which is that I think personally has definitely helped his game. I thought last year those times where maybe it didn't happen for him, but there was a lot of times last year where he looked like the best player on the pitch. Uh, and when he when he turns it on, he, he does look special. He looks sometimes if he's playing a game, a different game than everybody else, you know, or he's he's a minor playing with on the 14s because he has pace, he's direction, he's very very direct in the way he approaches the game, and he can get the scores and. Uh, so he's another player that can that can kick on big time, and I, I think you're right. You know, three or four years ago, he looked as if he was going to burst on the scene and own it. Uh, maybe fell away for a couple of years, but I think he was back. We've seen uh, patches of what he's about, it. and to say, you know, being in a good place mentally off the field certainly hasn't uh, detracted anything from that. In fact, I think it's it's helped him. And just before we finish, just to jump from Billy to Jack a little bit, the Leash Hurlers, who you were briefly involved with a couple of years ago under Eamon Kelly, have you been shocked to see? The, the jump that they've made under Eddie Brennan in such a short space of time? I just thought, the first thing that hit me when I, when I went and watched Leash, and I obviously, like, you know, South Armagh is not a, a hurling hotbed, but uh, the first thing I seen, I just thought the skill level was, was unbelievable. Now, obviously, that goes up a notch when you go to the Kilkenny's and, and uh, the Limericks and teams like that, but I just felt as if the skill level was there. They had a real hunger to achieve, um, I wasn't surprised at all. I was, I was, I was, I was delighted for him still to be in contact with some of the players and that. And uh, you know, they would tell you that last year was probably you know no nonsense. You know, as far as both management and players, they um, they were able to uh, to sort a few things out early in the season. Uh, they got a bit of win and got a bit of confidence and. Again, it's it's one of it's one of those things. It's, it's you know you're trying to still instill belief in the team, but until you get a little bit of a run of victories, that's very difficult to do. It's it's very difficult to sit in a room and say, you know, believe, believe, believe. But until you actually achieve something, you probably don't start believing. And they've had a snippet of that now, and, and I, I think already, as far as training and that concerned, they're they're ready to kick it on another bit. So then to jump on to the football championship next year, it's going to be all changed with the rules like the sin bin, the attacking mark, and like Jim Gavin is now gone. Do you, like, feels like things could actually be changed quite a little bit, or is it simply a case Dublin will probably get in the right man and they'll roll on as always? Dublin will probably get in the right man and they'll probably roll on, roll on as always. Uh, it's a big appointment for them, yes, but uh, the standards, they're lucky because the standards are being set by the players and now like if you go in and do something half hours with the dubs now you know the players are going to be all over that they're not going to accept it um so uh there's a good opportunity for the next man coming in um and it's a short of an all Ireland it seems like failure which for most people put a lot of people off but i think there's a lot of gays a lot of dublin gays who will think that they can maybe even improve things a little bit um and the championship as a whole, I think, uh, I think we we have a great championship if we if we could <coughs> ship Dublin off somewhere, uh, because the rest of the teams like there's not, there's very little between probably the next uh, ten twelve teams, yeah. uh, and that makes for a great championship. But I, I have to say I've enjoyed the last two years championship wise. I enjoyed Ulster in particular the last couple of years. Um, the, f- the f- football has changed, you know. Football has changed dramatically from uh, from the defensive stuff we were looking at. One of the reasons why we brought in the forward mark was, I feel, was to solve a problem that football has sort of sorted out itself. Mm. In that, um, defenses are not as log jammed as the ones we are. So, as I say, I think we might be a little bit late on that one. And then the uh, is is it actually possible we might create a problem, you know, unforeseen consequences by bringing this in now, after the horse is bolted and it's no longer necessary. Perhaps, yeah, perhaps. Um, I think it'll just be interesting to see how teams try to utilise it, uh, and how many teams see it as a as a. Uh, 
uh, many teams target it and how early on to target it. Uh, but as I say, for me, no real need for it now. Mm. And and the, and the one that which is which is which sort of blows my mind sometimes when I think about it is the sin bin because uh, brilliant, absolutely brilliant when we're in Crow Park, absolutely brilliant when we're in provincial venues playing and uh, championships with six, seven, eight officials. But the gay arriving to uh, cross the to um, referee a league match, you know, and he's on his own. He's got enough going on without having to manage four lads in the sin bin. I'm not saying that would happen in cross, but uh, but I'm sure it'll happen in, in some game. We have four or five lads in the sin bin, and the referee's trying to watch what's going on, watch what's going on off the ball, referee the game, and get boys back into the place. And it, for me, like I, I can't see when we know that that's going to trickle down into senior, intermediate, junior football at club level. You know how that could be pa- how that could be passed and pushed through. Like it's interesting you say if we could ship off Dublin because in general f- it feels like there are an awful lot of good games, but just always in the back of your mind you're like those teams that both get hammered by Dublin. Isn't that probably the main problem at the issue? And also the the situations where you have uh, mismatched teams, which happens too often in championship. I, that's what I tried to do over the last two years. I tried to stop my mind walking like that. I just tried to enjoy the games for what they were. You know, if, even if there were two weaker teams, if it was a good game, it was a good game. You know, if you enjoy the game, you enjoy the game. Uh, but in the back of your head, you're right. You know, the the, the dubs are, are looming large. And uh, I think everybody will get a little bit of heart from the two games that uh, they played against, or that Kerry played against them last year. Um, and they will see certain weaknesses in Dublin. But those weaknesses... I perceive weaknesses have been there for some time and nobody has been managed to uh, to get enough out of them to win games um, so the, the the Dublin thing is interesting for me because I actually think that Dublin could be better next year because I think there was a huge amount of psychological pressure on them to win that five in a row um, and I think now that they've done that there's a good possibility that they could get even better that's the last thing we wanted to hear. That's pretty depressing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> what a note to end on. Thanks very much, Oshin. Thanks, Shane.